Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video, tackling one of our top 10 lists. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's session presents 10 varieties of personal witness. Obviously, the Lord Jesus wants all to be witnesses, light shining in the darkness. He doesn't want to lose our testimony under the bed of laziness or the bushel of busyness. Some people say, I'm not the type, but if you're born again, you're the type. God designed us to be ourselves, so here's a sampling of the many ways we can be a witness. Number one, we have proclamation. Yeah, just let me say by way of introduction that people have a kind of caricature of someone who's involved in evangelism. They tend to be extroverts. They're not afraid to offend people. They let, you know, like water off a duck's back, any criticism that comes their way, kind of insensitive. It's really a gross uh, exaggeration of what God is looking for. When the scripture speaks about with meekness and reverence answering people, and uh, speaking the truth in love, we're not looking for people who are trying to win arguments. We're trying to win souls, and that's a very different thing. So it was my interest in being involved in teams of evangelists, inviting people to come together to do evangelism, to see that there's room for everybody on the team, that God doesn't pigeonhole us. He gives us lots of options. And this first one, proclamation, is the style of Peter, for example, where he stands out at Pentecost in Jerusalem and he preaches the gospel. And he makes clear statements, he quotes scripture, uh, he uses fulfilled prophecy, and he appeals to the people to act. And this is a, a very important part of evangelism, the preaching of the gospel. And it's diminished in many places today. Very few people are actually doing it. People think of Billy Graham or something like that. It must be a big thing. But uh, if you go to other countries, like India, for example, many of the men who come home from work, they stand out on the corner of their street and preach to the crowds walking by as they're waiting for supper time. So we can be involved in sharing the gospel in this way. When we're dealing with a crowd that's in movement, uh, we may have to have a series of short points. We don't have a captive audience where we're sure they're going to stay there, but a few sermonettes that we can weave together so that even if people are walking by, they get the whole sense of the gospel. It's a skill that needs to be learned, and uh, we need to go along with people who know how to do it. Some people use a paint board. There are other techniques. One of the famous ones was Silas Fox in India who had an Indian brother stand on the other side of the intersection and the man would call questions over to Silas Fox. How do you know the Bible's true? How do you know Jesus is the Son of God? And pretty soon a crowd gathered. It looked like an argument, but it was simply him calling the questions over and then he would answer them. So there are lots of ways to do this, sometimes in telling a story. It's a powerful way to get a crowd. So. Proclamation is a great way, not for everybody, but those who have a passion for it, it's an excellent way to broadcast the Word of God. Some people think it's all one-on-one, -on -one, but Paul said both publicly and from house to house. We need both techniques to fulfill the Great Commission. And our second one is apologetic. And this sometimes is very close to the first. The Apostle Paul was famous for this in the book of Romans, and he would reason in the scriptures. He would use the arguments of scripture. He would use the Old Testament to prove the deity of Christ, and it's a very good thing to do. When we say apologetic, we don't mean we're apologizing in a negative way, but we're giving a reasoned explanation for what we believe. And already we see a difference with these, with these two, and even more so with number three, hospitality. Yes, uh, usually set in the home, but not necessarily. Uh, there are people who take people out for a coffee to a coffee shop. 
There are other ways to do it, barbecues, picnics, where this can also be done. There's kind of a clue in the word hospitality that we're thinking in terms of a hospital. And the idea is we are providing the perfect environment for people to be relaxed and to begin to share some of their aches and pains spiritually so that we can minister to them in that way. Now Matthew is a good example of that. He brings the whole tax office to his home for dinner and he invites Jesus along. Sometimes there's a couple and their home looks like better homes and gardens, but they find it hard to connect with people. There's another couple and their house looks like a bomb hit it, but they're just people magnets. And maybe there's another couple and they've just recently been saved and to one couple to bring the crowd, one couple to provide the environment and the meal, and the other couple to come along and at an appropriate moment in the conversation say, hey, we hear something pretty amazing happened to you recently. Could you tell us the story? Now everybody is within their range of motion. People talk about getting way out of your comfort zone, but when my arm gets way out of its comfort zone, bad things happen. I have a range of motion. It's true that sometimes when I'm lifting I feel a strain. I'm doing what my arm should do. People shouldn't be way out of their comfort zone. They should be able to work, although sometimes there is muscle building, there's growth, but we should all be able to work within a sphere where we feel God has designed us for this task. Our next sphere is uh, good works. A beautiful example is Dorcas or Tabitha who lived in the coastal town of Joppa and uh, the Bible tells us that she was constantly doing good works, providing for the poor, caring for people in that community. When Peter came to town there was an open door for the gospel and I think again this idea of good works and good news provides opportunities for the gospel. We should not put our good works and our good news together because the tendency is for people to think you're trying to buy conversions by doing good things for people. But if we do good works and we share good news, let them put them together. And it's part of the act of faith for God to open a door. Once I've done a good work, for God to open a door for the gospel. But in my experience here over the last eight years, every time we have done a work like that in the community, God has also provided an opportunity in the gospel. And our next, number five, bringing others. Now, how is this different from hospitality? Well, we have an example in Andrew. Andrew doesn't seem to be one of the frontline people as far as the disciples are concerned. But I know people, and I just mentioned this, people magnets. Your wife is a good example who when she was saved and she really had a heart for people, she was able to bring them along to a Bible study, able to interact with them. And she may not consider herself to be the one to share the full gospel and lead them to Christ, although I think she could do it, but she certainly is a lovely bridge. She's non-threatening, but she's personable and she's able to bring people. Sometimes people like Peter who are out in the front line, people are a little intimidated but people like Andrew seemingly was the kind of man that you could draw near to. So the little boy with the loaves and fishes, the Greeks who wanted to see Jesus, and Peter himself was brought to the Lord through the ministry of Andrew. So these are invaluable people who can bring people out to a gospel meeting, invite them out to a Bible study, and they make friends of people. And through this, they bring people to friendship to Christ. I like how you described them as a bridge, making them comfortable and getting them to that new environment where they can hear the gospel. Right, and if you bring somebody along to a study, stick with them. Don't abandon them when they get there. Show them where the restroom is, show them where the coffee is, engage them in conversation after they're exposed to the gospel on the way home just to say, well, what did you think of that? Did you have any questions? and so we can capitalize on the opportunity in a relaxed environment. Our next one, number six, personal testimony. Now this is really powerful. 
Generally speaking, those who have been raised in Christian homes are skittish about using their testimony. We never hear Peter giving his testimony. Paul, on the other hand, who has this dramatic change, he is always telling his testimony. So sometimes a testimony is a little easier for someone to give who've had a bit of a dramatic change. Some of us feel like, well, I don't have much to say. You know, I was deeply involved in chewing gum before I put my trust in the Lord. And so we, we feel sheepish about giving our testimony. But I think we can still give a simple testimony. For example, we can say to somebody, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. It's a very simple testimony. But to say, I have joy and peace in believing. When someone comes to me, an atheist, with their arguments to our book table, I can say to them, you know, you can have your arguments or you can have my peace. You can have your arguments, you can have my joy. You can have your arguments, you can have my hope. You can have your arguments, you can have my life. It's a choice you have to make. You're going to have to give up your arguments if you want this. But I tell you, it's as sure as if God himself was speaking to you the message. So we have examples of um, the man born blind in John 9. I was just looking at this passage, and it's, it's kind of cute, actually, the way uh, here's a man who's largely uneducated. He's a beggar by the street, and uh, the Lord Jesus engages with him and gives him this opportunity to see. And the Jewish leaders, the theologians, are trying to argue with him. And he says, uh, one thing I know. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know how to answer your arguments. One thing I do know, I was blind, now I see. And they pressed him further and tried to engage him in an argument that they thought they could win. And he said, um, I told you already, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Now this is beautiful. When somebody wants to argue with us and say, listen, if I could prove to you that Jesus is the Son of God, would you bow down and worship him? And they say, well, I don't think you could prove that. I say, well, I didn't say I could. But if I did, would you receive him as your Savior? And they say, well, I don't think you could do that. Listen, you've spoken English most of your life. I didn't say I could prove it. You see, I think you're concerned that I can prove it. I think I can. And then you'd be obligated, wouldn't you? It's not an intellectual problem. It's a problem of the will. And so a testimony is a powerful thing. You can argue all you want, but this man says, I know what happened to me. And how can you argue against that? So we have people like that. The demoniac of Gadara. He wanted to travel with Jesus like a missionary. And Jesus said, no, you go home. One gospel says show. The other gospel says tell. It's time for show and tell. You go home and live Christianity in your own community. And he effectively did that, so much so that the very people who told Jesus to leave on that occasion, after this man had done his work in the town, they gladly received him into their coast. And that's very helpful because I think a lot of times we think gospel has to be this confrontational approach and just to see that example where that's not necessary, where the blind man just goes past that. Right, right. Uh, number seven, storytelling. We usually save our stories telling for children, but the Lord Jesus used it with hostile crowds. C.S. Lewis taught this during his writing of his Narnia series, that when you write a fable or a fiction piece, you make a tacit agreement with your listeners or your readers to go wherever you take them. So as you get closer and closer to the truth, as C.S. Lewis does, you start having this sneaking suspicion that maybe Aslan is really the Lord Jesus, the Lion of Judah. It's hard for you to say, hey, wait a minute, that never happened. You can't say that that's not true. <laughs> you know it was just a fiction piece when you started. All of Jesus' parables were fiction. They were not fables in the sense that there were talking horses and things like that, but they were real life stories that could have happened, which of you having a hundred sheep and so on. So they were true to life, but they were fiction pieces. And by telling these stories, the Lord Jesus got people to the punchline before they realized it. A bit like getting people to swallow a bitter pill with raspberry jam. 
So telling a good story, simple, a simple technique, a few details, a powerful punchline, an obvious conclusion. Look at Jesus' parables and learn how to tell stories like that because it's a great way to distance the person from the impact while still including the message. So if I'm talking to someone and I see they're getting real antsy, if I just say, you know, the other day I was talking to this person, they relax because they think I've stopped preaching at them. But all I'm doing is ricocheting off this other person that I talked to and they're getting the same message, but just one step removed. So it's a great way to share the gospel, especially to a hostile environment. Our next one, number eight, is lifestyle. Now, of course, this should be true of all of us, right? Paul says about the Romans, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world, Romans 1.8. And speaking about the Thessalonians, he says that you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And once again, the message had gone out through the whole province where they lived. So, as Paul says to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 27, make sure that your lifestyle suits the gospel. I tell the story about a lady who searched for God for 20 years in Ireland. And when her husband, who had a little construction business, hired a young Christian, she just saw the Christian out working in the yard. And she said to her husband at noon, don't let that man go home until we have tea with him. He has what we need. And there wasn't a word passed between them. So a personal testimony can be a very powerful thing, but a personal lifestyle witness opens the door for personal testimony. They'll ask us, what is it about you? And will you have an opportunity to share Christ? Number nine, incarnational. Yes, this refers to the idea that, and it's a very expensive idea, that when the Lord Jesus came into the world, he didn't simply come as a generic man. He didn't even come just as a Jew or as a poor Jew. He came as a Galilean. He came as a Nazarene. He identified so closely with the people that they would recognize the way he spoke. It was different than the Judeans. So when people are willing to cross cultural barriers and make the changes necessary, not compromise, every culture has positive things relative to the gospel, negative things relative to the gospel, and neutral things. And so we don't want to use the negative things, but we can use the positive things to advance the gospel and the cause of Christ. So people like Hudson Taylor, he wore the Chinese clothes, ate the Chinese food, even had a pigtail, and he lived among the Chinese as a Chinese person. And by that he was saying, I don't think my culture is higher than yours and that the way to become a Christian is to convert to my culture. Now that was a very strong influence in the British Empire, that people gave that impression. Our role is to spread our culture around the world. And if you really want to be a serious Christian, you have to take afternoon tea. That happened in many places like India. And what happened was the Christians, in order to be in fellowship with the British missionaries, had to abandon their own people, sit on a chair instead of the floor, have different musical instruments, different styles of music. Uh, everything changed and it actually built a barrier that didn't allow them to reach back into their own communities. So we don't want to do that. You don't have to be a good Britisher to be a good Christian. And uh, in Judaism, everything was very culturally established. But in Christianity, God designed it so any part of the world, you can function as a Christian without having to conform to a particular cultural style. And we need to remember that if Christians are willing to do this, it's a very powerful thing. We have like people who move in. They'll move into a neighborhood, a community that is full of people who are internationals from other parts of the world. They'll have 
uh, feasts for them. They'll cook up that kind of food and they'll befriend them. And again, through this, they get close to them so that they can share their burdens and eventually they can share the gospel. And finally, number 10, your way. <laughs> and that's, that's obvious, isn't it? That, that there's room for all kinds. God has a wonderful garden. He has some exotic flowers in it. And every one of us, God designed us to be us. When, you know, he blesses in spite of us, not because of us. And so if we try something that doesn't quite work, God can still turn it to good. I think of Bill Pell, a man of great influence in my life. When he was a young boy, his father was a wallpaper hanger. He took the scraps of wallpaper. Of course, in those days, they weren't pre-pasted. And he used the decoration on the outside of the paper and wrote Bible verses on the inside, traveled a train one distance out into the countryside, walked back and visited all the farmhouses, handing out his little gospel papers. That was the beginning of Gospel Folio Press. I think of an old lady in Northern Ireland who went around all the farmers and asked for their old tools and junk out of their barns, went down to Dublin, put up a table in a flea market, and had a sign that said, you can't buy anything at this table. And the deal was, you could come and pick any one item to take home, an antique, as long as you took a gospel CD to listen to it. I think of my daughter, Sarah, who Sometimes in the evening after the children are asleep, we'll go to Walmart and talk to the people restocking the shelves. Just to say, I believe the Lord wanted me to come here tonight to say thank you for all your hard work. They never hear this. We just expect the shelves to be full. And to express that, and pretty soon maybe she's talking to them about the Lord, even praying with them. So there are as many ways to witness as there are Christians. And we need to let the Lord show us how to move forward. The whole issue is, am I willing, and am I willing to be prepared, to learn a clear gospel message, to pray for the lost, to have my testimony and a little card so I can share it, and then to pray for open doors and opportunities so that the Lord might use us. There is nothing more thrilling. Now, at first, there's the, this huge impediment. The enemy wants to keep us back from doing it. But once we break through that, there's such tremendous joy in serving the Lord in this way, in talking well of Jesus and pointing people to heaven.